Hello, everyone. It's good to be back with you tonight. And uh, we've been talking about faith. And we've been speaking concerning faith toward God. You know, we've spoke many times here about how that most of the time faith is directed at our trials, our troubles, our difficulties. And we then become affected by the circumstances or the lack of movement or the lack of visible evidence that something's taken place. And so it's important that we come to the place to where we understand that our faith is directed toward God, who the Bible says nothing is impossible with the Lord. And so we, we speak here at Bethesda about faith toward God. And God then moves the mountain. God then calms the sea and the storm. God um, helps us with our difficulties and trials because the enemy uses our circumstances and people to disrupt the line of connection between us and God that causes our faith to be strong. And what he does is he uses the elements and senses and um, you know all the things that are happening around us to affect us and our believing. He throws those darts that come at us in between the time of believing God, praying for something, believing God, and the manifestation. It is in that believing and the manifestation where doubt, fear, and unbelief, anxiety, and all the enemies of faith kept start attacking us, trying to get us to waver and become double-minded. But when we keep our attention on Jesus, the Bible says when we focus our attention on God, we keep our eyes fixed on him. He keeps us in perfect peace. And we align ourselves with the word of God because the Bible teaches us that the word of God never fails. So we hold on to the word of God until the manifestation comes. God is calling us like in Mark eleven thirty eight. 38. He says to us, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that you have received them and you shall have them. I mean, that's Mark eleven twenty four. 24. And, and when we believe that, when we practice that scripture, then we understand that when we pray and believe, Whatever we're asking for, whatever we're praying for, according to God's will, comes to pass. And so um, we need to keep those passages in mind and also the other truths that we've talked about with faith, talking about how important our words are, talking about um, speaking the word of faith, how there is a language of faith that we learn and that we speak, um, because we need to know that we need to speak the words of truth. We need to speak the word of God that guides and directs our path and and keeps us from, um, you know, straying away or holding fast. The Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy than just something that we might think we hear out here. We have a more sure word of prophecy that we can go and we can try the spirits and we can test what's spoken to us um, because we have the word of God. And uh, so last week we were talking about, you know, speaking the word of faith how that we have to be careful that we, you know, we speak what thus saith the word of the Lord and that we do not allow pride and foolishness um, to enter in. Um, you know, we can be prideful in our assuming or guessing what God's will is, but um, what we, what we um, don't know is God's will we pray for. What we know, we act on. And, and so we are we pray when we are supposed to pray, and we speak when we are supposed to speak. When I don't know, I'm going to pray. When I do know, I'm going to speak. That's, that's very important because if we do it the other way around and we speak before we know, that's pride for, that's arrogant. Um, we, we almost are speaking as though we don't need God. And I believe that's exactly where the church has found itself many times. We're out here acting and speaking, and we really don't know. We're out here running our mouths, our, our actions, and we're not really speaking what is the will of God because we don't know. The scripture teaches us we err, fall short um, when we don't know the scriptures. And so it's very important that we know what the will of God is 
and we hear his word and not just assume that we know. We have to know that we also need the word of God confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Too many people today go by off of what they heard, what they feel like they're hearing. And I do believe there is an element of us walking in faith in what we hear, but yet um, for the biggest majority of the time, um, we need to take what we hear and submit it to those who are over us in the Lord that they can hear and also confirm what is uh, it, that God is speaking to us. And so anything else other than that is pride or arrogance and foolishness because, you know, we don't want to fall short of the glory of God. Uh, we want to press in and make sure that we are faithful to what it is that God is speaking to us. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about faith and humility. Faith and humility, because I believe they work together. Faith that is born on the winds of pride. Faith that is haughty or arrogant is an abomination to God. Today, a lot of times we see the church wielding faith in an arrogant manner in which they think that um, they can go around and just speak things, do things, uh, more or less directing or mandating to God what he is going to do, or even, even those who have been given authority uh, over them, they speak in a way in which it's not pleasing to the Lord. Um, it, you know, our faith is not to be haughty or arrogant. Matter of fact, um, uh, it's a religious man's approach to the walk of faith when you walk in arrogance and pride. Great faith is based on humility and trust, not on the ability to selfishly claim the promises of God or even the believing of great miracles. The just man's approach to the walk of faith is, burnt, is birthed out of the depths of humility. And so we can see in the scripture that um, God wants us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. He wants us to walk in humility, even as we operate in our faith, understanding that, that we in and of ourselves can do nothing. It, it's, it's not about what I can do. It's about what he can do in me. It's trusting God to work in me, not in the things that I can do myself. When we, when we look at the scripture, Matthew, <clears throat> the 15th chapter, we see um, Jesus uh, withdrew himself to the district of Tyre and Sidon and beheld a Canaanite woman um, that was there. And she came to him and she cried out, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. And he says, but he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came um, to him and begged him saying, send her away for she is crying out after us. But she came and she knelt herself down beside Jesus and um, she talked to him and, and, and she uh, said that, um, you know, she uh, was, that, that the bread, Jesus was telling her that the bread that he came to give was to the house of, the, of Israel, the children um, of God. The children's bread should not be given to the dogs. And her answer was, but Lord, yet don't even the dogs eat the crumbs from off the table. And Jesus answered her, oh woman, great is your faith. And so here we find somebody who comes along who really and truthfully should not even be somebody that they were speaking with. And yet um, she humbles herself before God saying that, Lord, it's not even about the bread. I'll, I'll take just the crumbs. Uh, in that humility, Jesus looks at her and tells her, you know, what great faith um, that you have. And the Bible says uh, in the very end of that um, verse, it says, and her daughter was healed instantly. So when we talk about faith, we need to understand that faith is based on humility, not on arrogance, uh, not on pride. It is, it is us having faith in God to do what his will is and for us to believe through our works that we do that Jesus Christ is more than sufficient. Luke 7 um, verses 1 through 10 talks about the centurion that came. 
um, had heard about Jesus and he came to him and pleaded with him to come and heal his servant. And the Bible tells us that, you know, Jesus, um, uh, when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent a friend saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself for I am not worthy. I am not worthy for you to even come into my house. And, and Jesus, um, uh, because of the faith and the understanding of the centurion, for the centurion um, speaks to Jesus and tells him that um, Jesus, I'm a man under authority, even as you are, and all you have to do is speak the word. Um, Jesus um, says to him that um, no greater faith had he found in all of Israel. And so, you know, faith came through humility and humbling themselves. And we need to know that. God's going to judge people who have uh, in pride experienced and received by faith the mighty workings of God in their life, but, show, but God will show favor and grace to those who are weak and lowly. Weak and lowly in our own abilities, but confident in the abilities of God. When I am weak, yet I am made strong, not from my own abilities, not from what I can do, but from my faith and humility, walking in Jesus Christ, knowing that Jesus is the answer and is the author and finisher of my faith. Just because I have humility doesn't mean that I'm weak. Humbleness does not mean weakness. Um, I'm humble in the fact that I know anything that takes place or anything that's done, no matter what it is, a miracle, um, whether it's victorious living or what it is, it's not out of my own strength or my own abilities, but it's out of my faith in Christ to do in me what I am incapable of doing in myself. And so when we talk about that faith and humility, we need to grab a hold of the fact that there is a passive and an active side of faith a passive and an active side of faith. Um, in view of the fact that God has called us to be believers rather than understanders, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, after I um, understand it, then I'll be able to believe. After I um, can weigh it out, I'll, I'll have to weigh it out, I'll be able to believe. But yet the Bible has called us to be believers um, rather than understanders. It's important that we understand what it means to believe in God, because there's both a passive side and there is also uh, an active dimension to believing. One deals with primarily with the heart of man and the other with the mouth. Romans 10, 8 through 10 tells us, and with the heart, one believes, but with the mouth, we speak. So we believe the passive side of faith is that we believe in our heart what God has said. We have faith in God and we believe in his word and we trust in him. That's the passive side, the believing in the heart. The active side is when um, faith arises and I speak what I believe. I walk out what I believe. I, I do what it is that I say I believe in. Trust is a state of being in the heart and it is either there or it isn't. It's not a matter of of working it up. It's either I trust God or I don't. In my heart, I trust God or I don't. And the Bible says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of trust, then I declare that with my mouth and, and speak what it is that I have trusted in, in my heart. When man trusts God, then what happens is words and acts of faith um, are the natural result of that kind of believing, that kind of trust. If I, if I say I trust God, but I don't have words or acts or works that back that up, then do I really have trust? He, Jesus said to those that were around him while he was on this earth, he said to the scribes and Pharisees, you praise me with your mouth, but your heart's far from me. So they, they were speaking things, but the actions and that was way off base. It's not just what we speak. A person can speak all kinds of things, but not have it in their heart. 
And so it's not a matter of having one or the other. It's a matter of having both. We have to have the passive side, which is the trusting, the believing, and we have to have the active side, which is the believing or faith. James told us in James chapter um, 2, he, he told us that our faith is not just a mere religious duty. If we're not careful, if we're not careful, then what we say we have as far as faith, our faith will be dead. But James said this as he speaks. He says, if you say you have faith, but you don't have works, your faith is dead. In other words, you're not really trusting God if you don't have works. For us to sit around with anxiety and fear and doubt and unbelief and for us to be fretting and, and, and fearful is not an act of, of trust, is not an act of faith in God. Um, but an act of trusting God, I trust you, Lord, then walks itself out with a believing heart that produces works of faith. Because James said the other side of that, if you say you have faith, but you don't have works, your faith is dead. He said, I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, I, I, I say to you that I have trust in God. Well, how I'm going to back that up is I'm putting that in action through faith to walk out maybe what I can't even see or what's not visible or what's not manifested. I'm going to trust God and how you're going to know that I'm going to trust God is by my works, by my fruit. The scripture teaches us that by their fruit, you'll know them. In other words, by their actions, what they produce, what comes forth out of here is how you will know them. If they say they trust God, but they walk in fear and anxiety and doubt, then you have to know that that's not the fruit of faith. That's not the fruit of trust. But trust produces fruit like faith, confidence, hope in Christ. And it, it is a walk of believing God for everything in our lives and knowing that if we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, God then rewards us openly before men because of the faith that we are living and walking in. Romans 8, uh, 10, 8 through 10 talks about, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes. With the heart, passively, I believe. That's that passive side. But he does not stop there. For, for with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The passive side is I, I believe in my heart. You hear a lot of people say, well, I don't have to go out here and, and, and say anything or do anything. Me and Jesus have our own thing going on in my heart. Well, you see, if you and Jesus have something going on in your heart, then you can't help but to have that faith or that active side of faith by proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. You, you can't keep it to yourself. When you discover that great treasure of knowing Jesus Christ and you believe it in your heart, then it can't be just between you and God. Me and Jesus can't just have a great thing going on, just him and I. Him and I just can't be an island because that passive and active side of faith both have to work in which then I testify of him that I tell the whole world that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. So with the mouth one confesses, or with, and, and with the heart one believes. But it takes both those things in order for us to please the Lord. It takes both the active and the passive side of faith for us to do what God wants us to do. 
When you are in, and when you when you are in love, you know you're in love. Likewise, when you have trust in your heart, you know it. When you have Jesus in your heart, you know it, and you want everybody else to know. It. When a man trusts God, words and acts of faith are just the natural result rather than mere religion. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, verse 5 shows the passive side of believing or rest, whereas verse 6 shows the active side of believing and works of obedience. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. We have to trust in God. We trust in God with all of our heart. And then he turns around in the active side of, if I trust God with all my heart, and I don't lean on my own understanding or I don't lean on my, the circumstances or I don't lean on what I see or what I personally think. The next verse says this, if you, if you trust in the Lord with all your heart and you do not lean on your own, own understanding, he says then in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And so if, if passively I trust God with all my heart, and if passively, I'm not going to go by my own counsel or trust in my own ways, but in every way I'm going to acknowledge God in the active side of faith, letting not just myself, but others know that my trust and confidence is not in what I can do or what I think or what I know or my intelligence or my gifts or my abilities. All of my trust and confidence is in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he can do through me. It's not me. It's not you. It's trusting in God for what God can and will do in us. Trust begets works of faith. In Exodus 15, Moses trusted God and he threw a tree into the bitter waters and drank and did not get sick. He trusted God. God, no doubt, dealt with his heart to do what he did, take the stick, throw it in the water, and he did it, and he drank there, believing and trusting God. When we trust God, it produces acts of faith. It produces that active side or active aspect of believing, which is faith in God and shows out in how we walk that out. Matthew chapter 14, very familiar passage of scripture. Um, Peter cries out, is that you, Lord? He said, yes, it's me. Well, if it's you, bid me to come. Jesus says, come, Peter. Peter passively believes that's Christ. He actively takes part in that by stepping out of the boat and starting to walk on water. Peter was a fisherman. Peter knew that man could not walk on water in the natural. But he trusted Jesus that what Jesus told him to do, that if he obeyed it, Jesus would be there. And the Bible says that Peter stepped out of the boat and walked on water. Now, we don't know how far he walked. We don't know if he took three steps, two steps, four steps, five steps. We have no idea. But we know somewhere in the, in the vicinity of that, walking out of the boat toward Jesus, Peter then loses his faith because he looks at his circumstances and there goes his trust, and he gets fear and doubt and begins to sink. But we know that when he actively calls out on Christ because he knew that Jesus would save him, he calls out to Christ. Christ responds by pulling him up out of the water. Peter trusted in the words of Jesus, got out of the boat, but he also trusted enough to call on him when he was in trouble. Matthew 14, 30, 31 shows us that the greatest enemies of faith or trust is fear. So then we know that the greatest friend of trust is the confidence that results from spending a lot of time in the presence of a faithful God. We know this. If, if you're going to trust somebody, you've got to know them. You're not going to trust somebody if you do not know them. You're not going to put your life in someone else's hands unless you know them, unless you know them well, unless you know them intimately. Um, and, and neither are we going to put our trust in God no matter what we say or no matter what's been preached to us or no matter what we know. 
we're not going to put our faith and trust in God unless we are intimate with him and we have a relationship with God that goes beyond the superficial. We have to have a relationship with God that goes beyond the historical. You know, knowing Jesus and reading about him and knowing that he was, uh, you know, truly, you know, what the Bible says, that's all good. But, but this intimacy that we're talking about that causes us to trust him goes way deeper than just a knowledge, a learned knowledge of him. It is an intimate knowledge of him in which we have an intimate relationship with Christ in which we know him in an intimate way which we trust him for everything in our lives because we know he will never fail us. That knowing God, that knowing God, causes us to be able to believe God. We know that Hebrews 11, 4 through 35 talks about a great cloud of witnesses of men and women who because of their trust in God performed great works of faith. They, they did great feats. They, they gave up their lives to be burned. They were sawn asunder. They were filleted alive with knives. They were fed to lions because their faith held them fast to trusting God even in death. Even in death. The world was not worthy of them. They showed that great faith and that great confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in Him even to the point of death. Isn't that the kind of faith and, and relationship that you want that even at the point of death, you know that the Lord has this. He, three Hebrew children, as I preached on a little bit Sunday morning and brought up, you know, one of the stories, people want to say those are just stories, the Red Sea, the plagues and the serpents and all the things that Moses did and, and the three Hebrew children, uh, all those are just stories. They're, they're um, allegories. But we all know us, us that are that are of, of the faith, those were not stories. Those were the miraculous things of God. The three Hebrew children didn't hesitate. They said, King, we're not going to bow down because we know this day the Lord will deliver us out of your hand. They were at the point of death, but yet because of their intimate relationship, because of their trust in their God, they refused to bow their knee to the idol. Our faith is going to be tested. It's not so that God can see where we are. God already knows where we are. But our faith is going to be tested because every test, every trial of our faith is for us. It is, it is a locator for us to see where we are in this process. I don't know if you know this or not, but we are in a process. We're saved, but we're being saved. I'm sanctified but I'm being sanctified. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, but I should be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a process. I'm, on, I'm in a process. I've given my heart to Christ, as, and I, as a babe in Christ, I begin to eat the sincere milk of the Word that I could grow thereby so that my faith would be developed, so that my faith would would, would be um, strong so that my trust would increase as my knowledge and intimacy with God increased, as I learned more about him from the word, but also learned more about him from this intimate relationship that we have. That faith increased and should continue to increase as I mature and am and, and no longer a child tossed to and fro uh, between doctrines or theologies, but I become solid in my understanding and my believing, trusting in God that God will always see me through. Paul said that when I was a child, I spake like a child, but when I became a man, when I matured, I put away childish things. This journey that we're on is a journey of maturity. We're growing up, growing up in the faith, growing up in the spirit, growing up in our knowledge and understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even becoming so mature that we are willing, that we are going to serve God and not compromise his word even unto 
dead. Man, that's tough. I know that's tough. Because what we face today is hard enough, much less facing possibly even the loss of our lives for the faith. We can't fathom that. We've had it so easy. You know, we're in a country where it's eat, drink, and be merry. We're in a country where, you know, man, this barn is is full. Let's tear this barn down and build new ones. You know, we're in the place to where we have three bedroom, two bath house, but man, it sure would be nice to have a four bedroom, three bath house. It, we have a 1,500 square foot home, but man, it would be nice to have a 3,000 square foot home. We're in that we're in that period of time of prosperity. We're in that period of time when things are good. Now we've gone through a little blip here, but up until this blip, you know, we we've had it made for the most part. Most people, not everybody, but most people. And the practicing of our faith is paid the price for that because the church today lives in hope, not faith. Man, I sure hope God provides. I sure hope God shows up. I sure hope God makes a way because hope is future. Faith is now. But I believe God is calling us to return to faith, now faith, now faith, that we would trust God and believe God regardless Paul said, I have learned therewith to be content, whether I abound or whether I'm abased. I have learned to be content. Paul was content in God, whether he was free or whether he was in prison. He knew that God was his only answer. He said, I count all those things that are behind me, but dumb, garbage heap, trash, manure, emptiness in my life. I don't look back at those things because they're nothing. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I trust in the Lord and the power of his might. It's not by might, not by power, but it's by your spirit, says the Lord of hosts. My faith is not in myself. My sufficiency is not in myself. My sufficiency is in God. That's what God's wanting us to return to, to trust in God. God's wanting us to return to um, what happened with Israel when they sent the 12 spies over into the land of Canaan. And they went over there. And when they came back, they were carrying between a rod one stalk of grapes. I mean, can you fathom that? A stalk of grapes that had to be carried on a pole with two men or more. Man, that's some fruit. But even no matter that they saw that the land was full of plenty and it was no doubt a land of paradise, they said that, that we were grasshoppers in the sight of the people of that land because they were giants. They said in our sight, in our own sight, we were grasshoppers. In other words, they saw themselves as nothing. But two individuals stood up and said, we're more than able to take that land. Joshua and Caleb were 40 years old at the time. Moses had promised them their piece of the, of the promised land. We are more than able to take that land. But the 10 spies turned the hearts of the people away and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. God said to them, the reason that you wandered in the wilderness for 40 years so, was so that I could show you what was in your heart. Listen, these trials and tests that we're going through right now in our lives as we're going through this process, they're not for God to, that God could say, okay, man, now I finally know where Jerry is at. No, it is the trials that we go through, the temptations that we go through, the difficulties that we go through, the battles that we go through, the fights that we go through, the war that we're fighting. It's not for God. It's for me so that I can see where I am. And I'm going to tell you what, a lot of times I, when I see where I'm at, I say, oh God, woe is me. How can, I, how can I be so foolish or how can I be so far away from your plan or your presence? And God just says, my grace is sufficient for you. 
return to me. My grace is sufficient. Return to your first love. My grace is sufficient. That's what God's speaking to us right now. Let faith arise and your enemies be scattered. That we would be a people of faith. That we would understand there's the passive and the active aspects of believing. And that we would have both of them working. Believing in my heart, but yet, man, confessing with my mouth. Confessing with the fruit of my actions. Walking it out in the presence of God. That's what God's calling us to. Being humble. Humbling ourselves and realizing that without God, we're nothing. Without God, we can do anything. Man, I believe, therefore I speak. I believe, therefore I speak. I don't speak in arrogance. I believe and therefore I speak. I speak confidently and boldly the word of God. But I come in a way and manner in which my faith is humble before him, knowing that without him I can do nothing. That what I need to do is what God is mandating in my life, and I have faith and believe God's going to see it through. He's still working on me, he's still working on you, but God said what he, the good work that he started in us, he will complete it to the very end. Do you have that faith today and trust? I, I want to say that I appreciate you so much joining us on Thursdays for a time in the Word. I hope that um, these times are a blessing to you and that you're receiving something out of it. Um, we're going to continue on in faith next week, and uh, we will be um, discussing um, faith and unbelief, the relationship of tribulation and faith as well. And uh, we're going to keep on going and studying, and hopefully um, God is blessing you in the process. God bless you today. Um, Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch each person's life that's listening to this broadcast today. Lord, that the word of God would work mightily in them. They would take these little nuggets and they would practice them in their lives. And God, that they would walk in your ways and not their own. Lord, that we would look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, and trust in you and not ourselves. Help us, God, that our faith would grow. Help us, God, that our faith would develop. Help us, God, that our faith would be strong and our trust in you would be great. Help us to know your word and to stand firm on that foundation. And God, I pray in Jesus' name, anyone that doesn't know you, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit convict you, them, you extend to them the gift of faith and the gift of repentance, and they come and enter into your kingdom. And God, we just ask in Jesus' name that you strengthen us to be the light and the examples that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today, and we're praying for you and hope that um, we'll see you next Thursday at 6.34. Um, a time in the Word. God bless you.